in the last video on the lungs or the gas exchange in our bodies or on the pulmonary system, we left off with the alveolar sacs. Let me draw one right here. So we have these alveolar sacs that I talked about, and they're kind of in these little clumps like this. Let me draw a couple of them just so you get the idea. And if you remember from the last video, these are kind of where you know air goes in through our trachea, then that splits up into our bronchi, and then those split into the bronchioles, and then the bronchioles terminate at these alveoli. So, let me, so that's the alveoli. These are these super small sacs that we talked about in the last video on the pulmonary system. You might want to watch that video if none of this sounds familiar. And then, of course, we have our bronchiole that feeds into this, and then that might have branched off from another one that feeds into another set of alveolar sacs. Well, I don't want to get too focused on that. I covered that in the last video. But let me label it bronchiole. Bronchiole. And then these are alveoli. These are alveoli. In the last video, we saw that air, when we breathe in, when our diaphragm contracts and makes our lungs expand and fill up that space, air comes in. Air comes in, and that air that comes in is going to be, as we're breathing atmospheric air, it's going to be 20, 21% oxygen, oxygen, and it's going to be 78% nitrogen, 78% nitrogen. And actually, in our atmosphere, carbon dioxide is actually almost a, a trace gas. It's less than 1%. So it's less, let me make that. It's less than 1% carbon dioxide. So anytime you breathe in on Earth, this is what you're going to get. And we said that in the last video that you have these capillaries, these pulmonary capillaries that are running all along the side of these alveoli. So let me draw those pulmonary capillaries. And so when they are deoxygenated, so they come here to be oxygenated. So when they're deoxygenated, they might look a little purplish. So when they're deoxygenated, they might look a little purplish, and they're running along the side of these alveoli. And then they pick up the oxygen from inside the alveoli. The oxygen diffuses across the membrane of the alveoli into these capillaries, into these super small tubes. And then once they do, that makes the blood red. And I'm going to talk in a little bit about why it becomes red. So then it becomes red. And now that the blood is red, it has its oxygen. The whole point is to get the oxygen. It's ready to go back to the heart. It's ready to go back to the heart. So that's just one little part of it. And we learned in the last video that something that goes away from the heart, so this is going away from the heart, that is an artery. A for away, artery. And something that's going towards the heart is a vein. So this right here is is a vein. Now, one question, and this is this actually came up in the last video, someone asked, which I think is a, a very good question, is, gee, you know, when we breathe in, we most of the air is nitrogen. Only 21% is oxygen. What happens to all that nitrogen there? How come that doesn't go into our blood? And that's actually a, an excellent question. So to answer that, I think that actually helps explain what's going on here. Let's draw a little bit bigger. So let me draw. Let me draw the alveolar membrane a little bit bigger like that. So this is the inside of my of an alveolus. This is its membrane right here, super thin, maybe one almost one cell thick. And then you have a capillary. You have a capillary running right next to it. So let me do that in a neutral color. So you have a capillary that's maybe running right along this surface. So this is its cap the capillary that's running right along the surface, just like that. Just like that. And this is porous to gases like oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide. And what we have here, let's say that this is, so the heart is over here. The heart is over here. So this is blood coming from the heart. And then this is going to go back to the heart. Well, the heart's on both sides. So let me write it this way. From the heart, from the heart, and to the heart. And what you have here is, when we're coming from the heart, this is deoxygenated blood, and it's actually going to have a high concentration of carbon dioxide. So let me draw carbon dioxide. Uh, well, let me draw carbon dioxide as green. I already did nitrogen as green. Let me do carbon dioxide as orange. 
So these are little these there's a lot of carbon dioxide and actually carbon dioxide actually gets diffused in the blood. It actually is carried in the plasma of the blood. It's not carried by red blood cells that we're going to talk about in a second. So that's a bunch of carbon dioxide here. And the the concentration of carbon dioxide in the deoxygenated blood is going to be higher than the concentration of carbon dioxide in the alveolus. So if this is porous to carbon dioxide, this membrane, and it is, these carbon dioxide molecules are going to diffuse, they are going to diffuse into, into the alveolus. Now on the other side of that, we have oxygen. We have oxygen here. We're breathing it in. The air is 21% oxygen, so you're actually going to have a lot more oxygen than carbon dioxide. And this is deoxygenated blood. We used all of the oxygen in our body, and we'll talk more about that either at the end of this video or in a future video on how we use it, but or where it goes in our body. But there's no oxygen here, so the oxygen is going to be taken, it's going to cr it's going to diffuse across this membrane. It's going to diffuse across this membrane because the concentration of oxygen is low. Now, the question is, so immediately you see that as the oxygen diffuses across this membrane, all of a sudden this is oxygenated blood ready to go back to the heart. This is so, you know, this transition between artery and vein is a very subtle thing. You know, very clearly here you say that, okay, this is going from the heart. This is this is our vein. This is going to the heart. Oh, sorry, let me, I always get confused. This is going away from the heart. And I, I was looking for an A, and I wrote from. This is away from the heart, so this is an artery. And this is going to the heart, so this is a vein. So you could make the division. You could say, OK, once it's oxygenated, maybe we're going back to the heart. But it's kind of an arbitrary, sorry, I spelled artery wrong. These are, these are my flaws. Artery spelling was never my strong suit. So you, it's it's hard to say where the artery ends and the vein begins. A good demarcation is when the carbon dioxide concentration goes low and that the oxygen concentration goes high. That's a good time where we start from the pulmonary artery. And I want to, in a, probably in the next video, I will uh, make a very, you'll see why the pulmonary arteries are special. Because pulmonary arteries coming away from the heart have no oxygen, or very little oxygen, and they have a lot of carbon dioxide. Well, pulmonary veins, so pulmonary, pulmonary veins, which is, you know, we could, it's, it's arbitrary when the artery turns into a vein, but we could say once it gets oxygenated, it's ready to go back to the heart. It's a vein, it's a pulmonary vein, and it is oxygenated. So it has oxygenated, oxygenated. And we could write deoxygenated, oxygenated. Now, the reason why I say it's special, besides the fact that pulmonary arteries and veins go uh, to and from the lungs, is that they're kind of the opposite. Because in the rest of the body, when we're going away from the heart, or we're talking about arteries, you're going to see that that's oxygenated blood. While when we're going away from the heart to the lungs, that's deoxygenated blood. Similarly, in the rest of the body, when we're going to the heart, we're going to see that that's deoxygenated blood. But in the pulmonary vein, when we're going to the heart, it's oxygenated because the the lungs are what uh, uh, take up the carbon dioxide and give us the oxygen. Now, I still haven't answered that that interesting question that rose on the on the message board on the last on the last video. What happens to the 78% of nitrogen that's sitting here? So there's just a ton of nitrogen over here. There's just a ton more than uh, more than the oxygen and a lot more than the carbon dioxide. What happens to all of these nitrogen molecules? And the answer is nitrogen can diffuse and does diffuse into the blood, but the blood's uh, ability to uh, take in nitrogen isn't that high. And you might say, well, you know, why is why is oxygen special? Why 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 can the blood take up oxygen so much easier than nitrogen? And that's where the red blood cells come into play. Let me write this down. I'll write it in red. Red blood cells, which are fascinating on a whole set of levels. Red blood cells. So what red blood cells, these are these cells that are sitting in, that they're flowing through our, flowing through our circulatory system. And they look kind of like lozenges, if I were to draw one. So they kind of have, they're kind of like a, like a flattened sphere with a little divot on either side of it, a lot like a, like a lozenge. So if I were to draw it from the side, it might look something like, well, from the side it would look like that. And if you could see through it, there'd be a little divot on each side. If I were to draw it at an angle, it would look something like this. 
It would look something. Well, let me. See. It would look like that, and there would be a little divot on that side, and there would be a similar divot on the other side. And red blood cells, and I could do a whole set of videos just on red blood cells. They contain hemoglobin. They contain hemoglobin. And maybe we'll do a whole video on hemoglobin. And hemoglobin are these small proteins. They're actually they they actually are. Uh, let me. That that contain four heme groups. So hemoglobin. Let me draw it this way. So inside of red blood cells, you have millions of hemoglobin proteins. And the hemoglobin proteins, I'll just draw them as this. They have these four heme groups. And heme groups, the main component is iron. And that's why iron is so important. If you don't have enough iron, you're going to have trouble processing oxygen in your blood, and you, 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 your hemoglobin won't be functional enough. But it has iron on it. It has four of these heme groups. And each of these heme groups can bond to oxygen molecules. They're very good bonders of oxygen. And, and we're going to see uh, in a little bit, probably in the next video, how they release the oxygen. But this has tons. This has millions of heme groups in it. And the oxygen, the oxygen diffuses across the membrane of the red blood cells and bonds to these little to the heme groups on your hemoglobin. So because the red blood cells have the hemoglobin inside of them, they're like these sponges for oxygen, because hemoglobin is so good at taking in oxygen. So the red blood cells are able to essentially suck up all of the oxygen out of the plasma. The plasma we can view is just the general fluid of the blood, not including the red blood cell. So the red blood cell here, the red blood cell here isn't so red. And the reason, and this is the key point, the reason why it's not so red, so maybe we had a red blood cell over here. And I want to make it clear, carbon dioxide, for the most part, is traveling within uh, the plasma. It gets, it gets absorbed into the actual fluid. And I'll talk about it in a future video. It's actually in a slightly different form. It's as carbonic acid. And that's actually a key point for how the plasma knows where to dump the oxygen. But I'll talk about that in a future video. But over here, this red blood cell has a bunch of hemoglobin proteins in it, but those hemoglobin proteins have dumped their oxygen. And it actually turns out it's the hemoglobin that, so with oxygen, hemoglobin looks red. With oxygen, hemoglobin looks red. It reflects red light. When it doesn't have oxygen, when it doesn't have oxygen, hemoglobin does not look red. It looks kind of purplish, bluish, darkish, you know, something, and that's why that's why in most of your body, your veins that have deoxygenated red blood cells look kind of bluish. So this is, and the reason why it changes color is that when the oxygen bonds to the heme sites on the hemoglobin, it actually changes the entire conformation, the entire structure of the protein. We've seen that multiple times. The whole protein folds in such a way that all of a sudden, instead of you know purplish or dark light being reflected, now red light is reflected, and that's why red blood cells will become red once they take the oxygen. But I'm going on a tangent. The whole point here is saying, why are we taking up so much more oxygen than nitrogen, given that there's less oxygen in the atmosphere than nitrogen. And the key is these red blood cells. These red blood cells have these millions of hemoglobin proteins inside of them. And they take them up, and they sop up all of the oxygen out of the plasma. Actually, they sop up about 98.5% of the oxygen. So 98.5% of the oxygen gets sopped up by the red blood cells. So these red blood cells are just traveling, and they're going to go back to the heart. That they are what make our blood red. So you have this thing, hemoglobin, that's sitting in red blood cells. It's sopping up all of the oxygen. So it keeps the oxygen concentration in the actual plasma low. You have nothing like that for nitrogen. There is no cell that's sopping up the nitrogen. Nitrogen does not bond to hemoglobin. So that's why oxygen is taken up so much better than nitrogen. This is a very interesting question, because you know it's 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 a you know it's a, if you just think about how much nitrogen is it's kind of a very natural idea now i want to focus a little bit on the red blood cell itself because it's fascinating it's almost you know in in the video on the structure of the cell i i start off saying oh well, you know all cells have a membrane and they all have dna now the fascinating thing about a red blood cell let me zoom in i just keep drawing the same drawing it has a little divot here it has a little divot here the fascinating thing about the red blood cells, I already said it has a bunch of it has millions of hemoglobin molecules or proteins inside of it. The fascinating thing about a red blood cell, it has no nucleus. No nucleus and no DNA. 
no DNA. This is this is mind-boggling when I first found it. I was like, well, why is it a cell? Is it really even a living thing? And it turns out when it's growing, it does have a nucleus. We all, you know, all cells need a nucleus with DNA in order to generate the proteins that build it up in order to kind of exist and 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 structurally make itself the way it needs to be made. But the whole point of a red blood cell is to contain as much hemoglobin as possible. And so you can imagine this is this was actually a favorable evolutionary trait that as red blood cells are ready to kind of go into the, into business, you've built the whole structure, they actually get rid of their nucleus. They actually uh, push their nucleus out of the cell. And the whole reason why that's beneficial is that's more space, more space for hemoglobin. More space for hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. Because the more hemoglobin you have, the more oxygen you can take up. And now I'm, I can do a ton of videos on 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 hemoglobin and, and all of that. And actually, I'm going to do a, a lot more on the circulatory system, so don't worry about that. But I want to go over one other really interesting thing about hemoglobin. I mean, we already talked about red blood cells. I think it's fascinating that they actually don't have a nucleus in their mature form. And they actually have very short lives. They live maybe 80, 120 days. Uh, so they're not like these long-lived cells that, uh, so, so you know, it's, it's almost a philosophical question. Are, are they still alive once they've lost their DNA? Or are, these, are they just vessels uh, for oxygen that aren't really alive because they aren't kind of regenerating and producing their own DNA. So actually, instead of going into the hemoglobin discussion right now, I'll leave you there in this video. I realize I've been making 20 minute videos where my goal is really to make 10 ones. So I'll leave you here. And in the next video, we'll talk more about hemoglobin and the circulatory system.